Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is the brilliant Eric Kaufman. Hello, Professor Kaufman. How are you doing? Good, good. Great to be with you, Lipton. No, the, the pleasure really belongs to me because you're so famous. You're well in demand. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's news to me. I mean, I know there's a few, few people who read my books, but uh, thank you for the compliment. Yes, yeah, so Professor Kaufman, some years ago, you wrote a very interesting book, The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America. Tell us a little about it. Well, yes, this is really growing out of my PhD work. I was really interested in this idea of dominant ethnic groups or majority ethnic groups and what happens when they uh, decline in number. And that was the case with the uh, WASP or white Anglo-Protestant Americans who um, went from being a sort of comfortable majority of US society uh, to sort of slipping below 50% around 1920. And then um, certainly by the 1960s, it, the, their decline was well in, in train. So that was something that I was interested in. And a lot of the same, in a way, what we're seeing now um, in many Western countries is a kind of reprise of what happened to the wasps in the uh, 20th century. So I was interested really in that history, partly as a, as a way of looking at what might happen in Western countries and, and what are the forces that leading to that decline or, or in what ways did the dominant group shift and change as a response to uh, its decline. So those are all the kinds of uh, things that I was looking at. And I uh, had to consider a lot of um, what we would now, what I called left modernism, this, this new fusion of liberalism and socialism that is the dominant elite ideology in the cultural institutions today. So that, I sort of trace the origins of that in the early 20th century United States, and then post the 1960s, how that achieved a much wider uh, penetration in the uh, media education system. Yes, Eric, but your, your book was particularly controversial because you noted that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, they created their own demise. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there exactly. I was arguing that it wasn't due to the Catholic and Jewish immigrants that um, that they declined. That those immigrant groups didn't have that much power. They had a little bit of, of clout, but not not a great deal. Um, it was mainly due to the white Anglo Protestant left liberal intellectuals, uh, people like Randolph Bourne yes. and others who uh, very much wanted to get away from their own culture. They sort of saw it as boring and, and un uninteresting compared to the immigrant cultures. Uh, and they were almost in some ways in revolt against their own society. And that was sort of the beginning of, of the counterculture, which then takes hold in a much larger way in the 60s. It has a much bigger effect, the effects of which we are living through very much. Yes, but, but in your book, you refer to four intellectual traditions that were that were developed in America. Libertarian anarchism is one and the other is liberal Protestantism. I would like you to speak about these two. I think they're very important. Yeah, so you've got these different strands of the liberal left, I guess you would call it. I mean, one is the, uh, the kind of anarchist uh, strand, which is, which begins really in the early 19th century on, on the frontier. You had these communes that were experimenting with free love and, and communal living and communal child rearing and, and um, a whole se series of things. Uh, and out of that comes, um, you know, some intellectuals like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, who lived on these communes. And out of that came kind of anarchic individualism, philosophy of anarchist individualism, which then bleeds into things like secularism, anti-religion, and ultimately uh, becomes part of what goes into the pluralist movement. And then you also have a more, uh, this ecumen ecumenical movement in Protestantism, which begins uh, in a serious modern way in the kind of mid-1900s, around 1905 to 1910, 1915. Probably 1910 to 1915, you start to see a shift in the uh, elite uh, the Protestant elites, these are the people in the parachurch uh, organizations, the um, National Council of Churches, uh, at, which, which then becomes, or initially the Federal Council of Churches, which would be the sort of parachurch body that's, that oversees the mainline Protestant denominations. And that becomes 
very much infused with this kind of cosmopolitan ecumenism, which is uh, eventually leads to an abandonment of, of, of missionary activity. And, and, and so this is sort of the uh, one area, another strand of this kind of um, liberal cosmopolitan mindset that begins in the 1910s. And then the third strand is, is the kind of modernist bohemian avant-garde in, in um, New York City in the in Greenwich Village known as the Young Intellectuals. Yes. So Eric, Eric, we're going to talk more about modernism, but for, for the present moment, I would love it if we could have a brief discussion on the role of liberal Protestant Protestantism and its deviation from traditional Christianity. There's a book titled Liberalism and Christianity written by a scholar who passed years ago. And he noted that Christianity is more than just a way of life. It's a faith that ought to be taken seriously. And many of our readers may not be aware, but Christians actually supported Darwin. Books have been written on this topic and the early Protestants were quite liberal. Many of them perceived a religion to be a way of life and not necessarily a grand philosophical meta narrative. Well, well, yeah. I mean, the the liberal Protestant. Of course, there was a big shift in in the liberal Protestants and even in the ecumenical movement, which was initially just about uniting different Protestant sects under the banner of common Protestantism, and they were very much uh, opposed to Catholicism. And then, it, and then it sort of shifts and, and it becomes uniting Catholics and Protestants and other groups. And once it does that, it sort of really loses that kind of focus on, on the sect and becomes sort of much much more of a kind of open-ended cosmopolitan movement, which is then allied to you know, various uh, pro-immigration movements, various uh, liberal movements. And, and it becomes that and it continues to be that. And in a way, the uh, mainline denominations are, are the most liberal now. And, and of course, they're in decline the membership yeah they, they, they're they're declining because people are more likely to attend church and invest their time when the faith is based on a complicated doctrine it's no, called religion for for a reason yeah exactly i mean a more sort of otherworldly strict type of religion that that is the model that tends to succeed better in a western context uh, and and in a way if you're going to be a liberal probably you'll be a secularist now so there's not much point being in a liberal denomination uh, for the most part. So you, so these denominations are losing dramatically. I mean, the latest figures I saw for the mainline uh, Protestants in the U.S. is just unbelievably dramatic declines um, over the last, say, 50 years, but even in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yes. For example, in, in Europe, there are priests who don't believe in God. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know yeah. the details. But, yeah, but, but I've I, I, I read I've read that in in a few books. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's All a strange right. situation, but most people like a pastor <laughs> who is boisterous and and challenging, and this is one of the reasons why the evangelical movement is growing. Well, because yes, it's, it's it's offering something that's deeper than ourselves. Yeah, I think that's that's probably right, and, and you see a very much a split where the the sort of middle, a kind of mainline Protestants are shedding members either to the evangelicals or to the secular side, and and the middle is really hollowing. So that's been going on now for decades, uh, but maybe it seems it might be accelerating. Yeah, no, no. Let's tell us about the big guys in the room, the the modernist movement. Yeah. So so really, what is modernism? It's anti tradition. Uh, it's about um, the individual against the group. Uh, it is about um, rejecting the past in a way. And, and so this is really the, a movement that begins in the late 19th century, according to the sociologist Daniel Bell. It's associated with uh, Bohemian uh, avant-garde groups, which are really, you know, some of them flirt with communism, but a lot of them are not necessarily communist. They're more into simply radical expressive individualism but that typically as we move into the 20th century leads many of them to be a bit lefty in their politics not necessarily socialists but some some do and and then that sort of modernism then infuses the 1960s counterculture uh which is very much um oriented against traditions such as national identity and religion um and you know the the john lennon 
song about, you know, wish there were no countries, no religions is sort of an expression of that outlook on life. Uh, and then that modernism, of course, becomes fused with uh, with a radical socialist outlook on the left, which is about revolution and transformation, radical transformation. And so instead, what you get is these two things coming together. The modernism, which was initially about modern art as against traditional art, uh, and it was about free love and, and, and experimenting with watching jazz and drinking alcohol and all kinds of things. And then you sort of get that fusion with the socialism, which starts to happen in the late 1930s going forward. And particularly by the time we hit the 1960s, it's starting to crystallize into what we now know of as identity politics. And, and in the sense that it takes the modernists were very much against sort of what they saw as boring Anglo-Protestant culture, which didn't like to drink and dance and didn't, ha and, and that, so exotic was good. That then is grafted onto this victim oppressor worldview, which comes from socialism. Initially it was about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but it gets transfused and transposed onto uh, victim identities, typically racial, gender, sexual identities, and oppressors, typically white, male, straight. Uh, and that then be, emerges as the new religion of the modernist left in the late 1960s with the radical student movements. Uh, all of the demands that were made by the you know, Students for a Democratic Society, the Black Panther movement, all of these sorts of things, feeding then into this new bohemian modernist culture, uh, which is very much about identity politics and concerns already by the late 60s, uh, a, a veneration of these grievances. And that then, then builds and builds as these then become the academics, they then become the journalists, they then become the educationalists, that then seeps into the corporations, uh, HR departments. And that's this is sort of bringing us really to where we are now. I mean, already, already in the 1960s, you could see the influence from that left modernist bohemian subculture into the knowledge work sectors. Uh, that was commented on by Daniel Bell and others that there was, so, so for example, Black Panthers were featured on the cover of Vogue and Esquire. I think it was Vogue magazine. Uh, the radical chic was already starting. Uh, this flirting with the radical as a way of distinguishing yourself as being more sophisticated. I mean, that those trends were already beginning in the 60s. They've only deepened. Uh, and we're living with that culture now, um, which is the dominant culture. Yeah, I have a brief re response. The the countercultural movement in the 60s is anti-hierarchy. So, for example, Twitter is a space for activists to hold people like yourself accountable. But this has always been my opinion. A, a, accountability only exists when there is an obligation. So, for example, if Bill Gates opts to buy 500,000 acres, that is not my business. I am not his money manager. The fact that Bill Gates seems like a nice person or cares about the, the environment doesn't mean that he's obligated to people on Twitter. Um, so sorry, did you, your question was that... Uh, no, 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 I was giving a, a brief response to, to the countercultural movement and its attack on hierarchy. Right, yeah, right, so for right. example, yes. the, the concept of accountability. So you, Eric, you're not accountable to me. If you make a statement on Twitter and I don't like it, that is my business. Right, right. I mean, I think this counterculture, um, I mean, I would say it was yes, anti-hierarchical, but I would say it was already authoritarian by the late 60s. If you read what people like Nathan Glazer were saying about the Berkeley student movement, the they were saying, you know, the free speech movement, which was initially about the right to protest the Vietnam War and, and things express yourself very quickly um, flipped into becoming an anti free speech movement already by the late 60s, they were trying to say who can come on the campus, no military recruiters, no corporations, you know, you, professors can say this and not that already there was censorship uh, and anti intellectual bullying going on within the student movement, and you could see the seeds then of of that left-wing authoritarianism were there right on the ground floor. And so it's not surprising that this is continuing and has gotten worse. Yes, and I, I don't like it when people tolerate mob culture. When, if, you, if you have children, at some point you must be a parent. Mm 
there is always mm. a line of authority. And it's nothing to me suggests emasculation more than people genuflecting to mobs, whether it be the Twitter mob, the Facebook mob, or random academics. Yes, and, and, and what's interesting is if you go back to the 60s, you, you see, it, again, it's predominantly caving in. I mean, the university administrations are now, now the academics were not as left wing. So a lot of them in votes would be against the student occupations of, of the, uh, the dean's office and all the, 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 the antics that, that the students undertook. But you saw a lot of capitulation and not a lot of um, assertion of what values the university was trying to protect. Uh, and Daniel Bell was very critical of that, um, saying that, you know, there's just nobody being an adult in the room. And that, that so that goes back a long way. And we, you know, we really have failed, I think, for 50 years to articulate what is the, what are those quote unquote bourgeois values that are, that we stand for and to resist the allure of the kind of young, young, angry radical. I mean, that there seems to be a, a romanticization of the young protester that somehow this is, well, they must have some kind of deep spiritual understanding and therefore we can't really uh, say have discipline in terms of uh, a university setting uh, to try and sort of control these movements. Of course, you, you want to allow protests, but at the same time, there's just too much reverence, I think, accorded to that that mode of expression, which is an anti-intellectual mode often and, and a mob mode often. And there just doesn't seem to be a consistent approach uh, of standing up to them. Now, of course, there were politicians, uh, Senator Hayek Kawa in California, uh, who became a senator. I mean, there were some instances of this, but the it seems to me that, that the West failed to articulate uh, in a consistent manner, what, where are the red lines, what will not be tolerated, and, and why these values are important to uphold. Uh, and instead, there's been a lot of romanticism and a lot of sort of acceding to uh, to this kind of activity. Yeah, I, I, I refer to it as venerating hooliganism as resistance. That, that's yeah, my I mean, term. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you know, a more robust defense of, of values around order and around uh, intellectual debate that is <clears throat> following the rules of debate and, and is not simply about uh, exerting force, for example, and, and why if hierarchies exist, they're justified. Uh, if they're not justified, fine, reform them. But this, this notion of, of simply uh, thinking that, you know, protest and radicalism is great uh, you you have to just go with it. You can't resist it. I mean, that seems to me to be the mode that's uh, that was the route that was taken in the '60s, the route that was taken in in the '80s and '90s when political correctness emerged, and and also what's happened more recently. I just think now that it's been ratcheted up to such a high level, yes. hopefully it'll prompt a more intelligent um, and principled and institutional response yeah. eventually. And <laughs> and this is, yes, and this is manifested in immigration discourse. So, for example, m well, not most, but the all I, I would say all countries believe that the border should be managed properly. If I want to reside in America, I ought to do so legally. I cannot show up and determine that I'm going to become an American without applying to, to the relevant channels. You, you, yeah, you, I mean, so for uh, let me continue. The, the the term illegal alien is no longer politically correct, and it's simply and this discussion is, is simple to what we just talked about hierarchy. So if you call someone an illegal alien, you are definitely saying okay, it is a he, he is different from us. So right there, there's a there there's an, a line of hierarchy. Yes, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think there are two aspects to it. One is the anti-hierarchical, which is to some degree that modernist thrust of, of anti-tradition, anti-hierarchy. Um, and you see it with defund the police as well and abolish immigration border control. Um, it's a similar impulse. Uh, I think it's disastrous in both cases. But there's also this other uh, more kind of post-60s 
uh, egalitarianism, which is sort of about the victim oppressor matrix and the sort of oppressed, um, not just physically, but um, psychologically. So Words are of, violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that this sort of emotional safety, emotional harm argument, which um, also is sort of used to justify not using uh, a word like illegal, like no human being is illegal. Well, actually, yes, the, they are, you know, if they cross a border illegally, they are an illegal immigrant, uh, you know. So that, that I think is where this, and this focus on words and how they might offend and how they might emotionally harm and lead to trauma, you know, so that, that discourse around sort of uh, psychotherapeutic uh, terms like trauma and safety has been grafted on more recently to an older uh, discourse, which was more about sort of structural oppression, and, and, and that's part of it as well. Um, but but yeah, anti hierarchy blended up blended with this sort of therapeutic uh, egalitarianism. Those two things together um, are informing this whole crusade. Yes, but we, we did say we we're going to talk about some of the strands you mentioned in your book. So I'm going to turn to academic cultural determinism and anti-Darwinism. What do you mean by these terms? Uh, well, academic cultural which again? A academic cultural determinism and anti-Darwinism. Oh, right. Well, I think uh, what, what that's getting at is this idea of the blank slate that essentially uh, people are uh, say the gender they are because they're taught that to do that and behave certain ways. If they weren't taught that, they they would wouldn't could be a different gender. I mean that's sort of again the view that it's all about environment and that genes yeah. and uh, nature doesn't really matter for uh, certainly gender and 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 actually you could um, uh, you you know it also bleeds into beliefs about that you can radically transform a society, change its identity overnight because. You know, essentially, it's all about um, the, the, what the political elites decide to do, and and there's not a whole lot of constraint from underneath. You know, it's a similar sort of view of of you can do radical change, blueprint for a new utopia, completely change the society around. Uh, I think it's a similar mindset, which is which is based on um, that it's all a blank slate, and you just have to sort yeah. of, so but, so, but, but, so but, this but, stuff but, about changing words the belief that somehow that's going to radically you know, remove all inequality and racism and everything from society and we're suddenly going to have this utopia because we've changed a few words you know that's an that's an example of this kind of thinking yes but you, eric I, you didn't take the bait i was expecting you to re refer to france boas and cultural relativism oh boy oh that's yes you didn't take the bait Boy, um, well, I mean, Franz Boas, I mean, this is going back to a debate, though, in the US over, um, well, what, I guess, what's called eugenics and, and this idea that certain races are uh, more desirable than others, which I think is, you know, was wrongheaded. And in a way, the Boas showed, I mean, what's interesting is you had these people using skull measurements that showed that, you know, I don't know, the, the Anglo-Saxons were at the top and then you had various groups and Irish and various others. Um, and I think Boas used, the, he actually used the same skull measurement technique and showed, well, no, it was to do with foreign born and, and native born. The native born actually had similar skull shape, size, whatever. But but I think that that got, in, got into a debate over um, to what extent, yeah, I mean, to what, to what extent countries should attempt to uh, regulate immigration in such a way as to, uh, I mean, I, I think with Boas, it was more that he was in the, he was more anti-eugenics, which I think at the time was probably in many ways the right um, place to be, but but I think he was just part of a stream of thought that then yes. morphs into multiculturalism. And yeah, radical Boas, Boas and his students promoted the idea that all cultures are equal. And just because of the, the legacy of Boas, why we can't say that a particular culture or, or some cultural traits are superior to others. Okay, I didn't really, I mean, I, I hadn't realized his, that he was that radical in terms of all cultures are equal. I actually thought he yeah. wasn't. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's a bit more nuanced, but he created yeah. the, the platform for that movement. Right, interesting, yeah. I mean, I, 
I have to read more of my Boas. <laughs> so. Yeah, but 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 root people like root Benedict who agreed with Boas when they did their research, they did argue that some practices practices are maladaptive, but the, the their followers don't share these ideas with ordinary people. So even the original cultural relativists weren't that radical. No, I mean they they I know that Mead was and then and others were completely airbrushed the nature of the Polynesian societies they visited, pretending it was a free love paradise and things when actually it wasn't. Um, so there was a whole lot of uh, projection of Western fantasies onto these societies, uh, certainly by Mead, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and it's also the case that some of these relativists now would be seen as, as very politically incorrect. I, I think, uh, who was it that went to Tahiti in the 1890s, an artist and uh, the primitivists, uh, and I'm, the name is escaping me, but essentially all of that romanticization of the Polynesian cultures as being uninhibited sexually and all this sort of stuff is now seen as um, horribly Orientalist and, and, and Eurocentric, which it kind of, they're kind of right in a way. There was this projection onto these societies, but it's just interesting that what was then seen as radical and kind of, you know, very subversive is now seen as kind of uh, very colonialist. Um, so these, it, it, it's amazing how these things kind of come around and go around. Yeah, but what, what yeah, I, I'm going to digress a bit, but what I find really interesting and troubling, Eric, is that feminists are arguing that trans women should not be able to play sports with biological women. And this is very funny because for years, feminists either downplayed or ignored sex differences yeah yeah well i mean i think you're right that that there's a group of feminists that's the um trans exclusive or gender critical feminists who are opposed to the uh trans women participating in women's sports or, or entering women's spaces and um yeah i think there are various strands of thought i mean some feminists are sort of uber you know, actually think, no, yes, it really, the, the biology really matters and women are radically different. And then others say, no, it's all a social construction. So I'm not, I'm not in a position to know if the yeah. trans exclusive radical feminists are, are the descendants of that more yeah. biological but, version of, of feminism. Uh, perhaps but, but, that explains it. I, I'm not an expert enough to know. Yeah, but based on my reading of feminist and critical fe feminism, many of them don't play sex and gender differences. However, I do believe that feminists on the left who are against the trans movement want to protect lesbians. So for example, a lesbian is a woman who's attracted to other women, but the, the concept of a trans woman annihilates the idea of a lesbian. So I think it's really political. It's not that's, so much- Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you're, I think you're right that that's one of the irritants. Yes, uh, the, 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 yeah, it's not really about protecting ordinary women. They want to protect the sacredness of lesbi lesbi lesbians. Interesting, yes, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't gotten that uh, I didn't. I don't. Didn't know whether it was just a lesbian movement or whether it was a uh, a movement of some lesbians, some non-lesbians, which I thought is what it was. But yeah. So I, Kat I'm not Kathleen well Kathleen Stock, she recently wrote a piece for Quillet, and it was titled "A Lesbian Attracted to a Woman," something to that effect. Right, yes, I saw that. Yes, yeah. yeah no, no. <laughs> so it's it's really not so much about protecting girls, but protecting lesbians whose identities are being immiserated because of trans women. Yeah, 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 I mean, interesting. I, 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 I wish I was better informed on all of the ins and outs on these, but uh, <laughs> no, you, you, you're a busy man, and it, yeah, I mean, identity politics can become quite boring. So, in our previous discussion, I said to said to Michael Rechtenwald, James Lindsay should be a bright guy, but he's talking about anti-racism, and that's a, a waste of productive time because these ideas are just so boring. <laughs> well. They're boring, but once they've moved from the field of high theory where they were relatively harmless to the field of being applied in real life, in real policies, they become actually very harmful, very dangerous. So I think he's, he is right to focus on, on this issue. And I think he's influenced then someone like a Chris Rufo, who's more- Yes, Christopher Rufo. 
yeah, who's more practical and who's managed to get this into legislatures and, and, and really rev up a whole legislative program, which I think is actually very needed and very important, uh, particularly with regard to um, K to 12 school education to try and root out some of the racially discriminatory um, teaching that's going on where people are asked, you know, all white kids are told they're yeah, privileged. And they parents are being told to reflect on their whiteness. Yeah, exactly. So, so this radical stuff is, you know, through the education schools and because the teaching profession tends to be very left leaning and particularly the teaching training is even more and, and, and is f infused with all of this radical uh, anti-white stuff. And of course, that anti-white stuff goes back to the early modernists who were anti-WASP. You know, it's a similar impulse, but but transformed by this kind of victim oppressor matrix now into, be, into being. So they really believe that they're, they're fundamentally going to uh, radically revolutionary society. So all these kids are going to grow up without a racist boat in their body or something. I mean, it's completely unscientific, untested. Uh, it's just religion. But in any case, um, yeah, I think it's very much something that is worth fighting against. And I think Lindsay's been very important in that. Uh, so, so even though the ideas may be garbage, I think it's worth, it's very important to be able to take them on, come up with clear arguments why they're, um, why they're wrong and be able to articulate that very well. Uh, and I think Rufo in it, as well has done that. Um, yes, quite effectively. But r racism is a negative. But remember, Eric, without evil, we cannot have good. Out of evil atrocities, we have created legis legislations that assist minority groups. No, I am not saying that we should engage in evil to have better laws, but it's just re the reality of life. If we were only good, there would not be a standard to determine evil. So racism is a negative. But can we truly eradicate it? No. No, I think you're right. We can't eradicate it. Um, I think we can have norms and um, um, and and laws where applicable. Uh, but but I agree. But I guess my bigger concern is the um, is actually the inflation of the term racism from meaning feeling superior or, or hating someone of another race or discriminating against them um, in the workplace uh, or, or, or in, in some other valued social good. So the clear traditional definition of racism is now morphing into uh, something that is ideological, that, that in a way you're part of a vague matrix that you can't even see and you can't even, all we, the only way we know it's there is that uh, maybe one group is not doing as well as the other group. And so, so we know this mysterious force field is somehow acting on us and we're unwillingly doing its bidding. That's sort of what critical race theory is about, that, that we're kind of duped into, uh, you know, and, and it's in the words we say, you know, if we say master bedroom, then we're reinforcing slavery. You know, this is sort of the, the level. Our, um, our manhole, we shouldn't say manhole, is that? Right, right. Yeah, it's funny how certain terms like, man-made is fine you know <laughs> and and so master bedroom is bad but you know there are some other terms like uh, you know use of the term black seems to be okay i i, I the, the rules are mysterious but it's it's all about uh innovators um really religious i would see it as as innovator preacher innovators who can say aha the american flag is you've got to cancel that because it's associated with racism so, so they're trying to constantly find you know, through our offense archaeology to associate racism with new things. It's like the devil associating this and that as a sign of the devil. Or, so, so it is all about innovation and everyone, you get people behind you in a Twitter mob and suddenly you feel a surge of righteousness that you're carrying forth this crusade. So that is sort of the mindset of this new woke uh, intelligence, but, but, you know, which but, is a sort of decentered online intelligence yeah, yeah yeah but but eric it's quite unfortunate that i call them the wokeists the wokeists don't really understand the philosophical basis of their ideas so for example they appear to be romantics but these are young people who like their phones and hunter gatherer societies engaging in fantasy, and neither did such societies promote the right environmental policies all the time so, 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 identitarian would prefer a more romantic era would not do well in a truly untogether society. 
but at the same time, they dislike capitalism, though capitalism provides them with Twitter and the phones to promote their message. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're completely hypocritical and, and, and there's no consistency there. I mean, what I would say is they romanticize the, the oppressed groups, so they have a completely starry-eyed view of, of indigenous people, for example. They, I guarantee most of them have never set foot on a reserve. Uh, they don't know anything about you know, native Indian logging firms and, and they're, you know, so, so there's a complete romanticization of the indigenous culture, the, the, their history that in fact, there was a ton of violence that was genocide. Yes, violence, uh, they're this statistic. One writer said that during 1920 to 1955, the homicide rate of one group was over four times that of the states. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and if you look at any history, you will realize right away that that you know that your chance of being killed violently as a hunter gatherer is about uh, one in five in your lifetime, and it's even at the height of World War II, it was only about two percent in in um, in Europe. You know, so so really the the violence and the the uh, of these early societies that are complete it's completely glossed over by these starry eyed uh, because they're just focusing on one enemy, which is the white man, the West. Um, and completely lose track of, of any kind of context uh, to their beliefs. So yeah, they're not really consistent anything, not consistent romantics, but they'll romanticize um, the power of so-called oppressed identity groups and they'll completely demonize the uh, so-called powerful groups. Uh, yeah, it, 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 the only consistency there is, is some sort of victimhood oppressor point hierarchy. Yeah, it's just like the, the idea of white privilege. So they yeah. talk about white privilege, but black people in America have black privilege because black Americans are better off than blacks in Africa. And they're also better off than whites in many places in Eastern Europe. So it's better to be a black man in the States than a white man in Ukraine or Russia. So there's American privilege and blacks and whites benefit equally from American privilege. Yeah, well, that's a very good point, Lipton. And, and um, you're right in this whole question of you know, privilege, right? So if I say, well, right-handed people have privilege over left-handed people, um, but if you actually look at it, maybe that's a really, really, really small effect, right? So it's not enough to say, well, there is a slight difference. People who are taller have, a, you know, the question is how big an effect is it? How much more privilege does, does a, um, a six foot person have compared to a five foot 10 individual or five foot eight individual? There is something there. But we have to know not just if there's a privilege, but how much of a privilege it is. Now, it depends too where you're living. I mean, if if I go to I've lived in Japan a lot of my life, there's no question that people are going to point at you and uh, you know call you things. Sometimes it's just the nature of being a, a minority in in, a, in another society. Now we want to try and reduce that as much as we can, but it's never going to get to zero. Uh, just seems to be one of these things that so we can reduce it but i think to make that into sort of the biggest thing the biggest problem that exists i think uh is to lose sight of so for example the, the by far the strongest privileges are uh probably parents socioeconomic status and uh, probably intelligence those two things which are are not it's not about race gender sexuality um but yet the focus is almost entirely on the race, gender, sexuality, because yes. those have been politicized. You're not going to get the all of the low IQ people to form a, a, a political movement easily. They're not easy to organize. There's no history of their organizing, no myths, no nothing to work with. So they're not going to be a factor in the way that um, minority identity groups of various kinds are. Um, yes. and, and so it's very political and very selective as to which privileges you pay attention to and which ones you ignore. It's just like Raj Shetty research that was published in 2019. Black boys do better when their father is present and mm. black women out earn professional white women. So pr the concept of a privilege is multidimensional. Oh yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's very multidimensional and I'm sure it can all be quantified too. I mean, this is one of the things, I think Wilfred Riley or somebody has, where you, you take a person and you take all their characteristics and you say, how, which is best correlated with um, outcomes like income and, and uh, lifespan and everything like that. And I'm sure, you know, maybe race matters a tiny, tiny amount, 
uh, and, and you know, yes, ideally it wouldn't matter at all. Um, but losing sight of what are the real big effects, which is you know, socioeconomic background, class, and also probably intelligence. So these sorts of things, which should, I mean, if we're going to talk about anything and and trying to equalize, those should be the things we're talking about. But uh, but yeah, so that that that's not what's being romanticized and focused on on right now. I mean, the other thing you mentioned about yeah, blacks. Of course, you can look at huge income differences between you know Nigerian. Uh, Nigerians and Somalis or, or you know, so there, there are these massive differences with, within groups that are much greater than the differences between groups. They get no attention at all. The gender difference, uh, the difference between black boys that are, as you say, raised in two parent households versus single parent households. Uh, all of that is is much more important and, and receives no attention because it doesn't fit in with a, a romantic identity project of opposition and, and revolution and, and all of the things that appeal to uh, white upper middle class kind of left modernists. Yeah, I'm really happy that you, you mentioned Nigeria because I've done some research on the Igbo or we popular call them Igbo. So the Igbos in Nigeria have done very, very well. But what's also striking is that the descendant, descendant of the Osu, so the Osu was a slave, he was in the shrine. So his descendants are treated as less than the normal people. But despite discrimination, the Hosu has done quite well in Nigeria. Very, very well. I didn't know. I didn't realize that uh, that was the origin of the... Uh, I know there are, there are quite successful... You have a number of... There's, there's, there's a number of successful groups like the Lemba is another group. Yes. Um, and, and these trading, like typically trading minorities... The Jews are an example, the Parsis, the, the Igbo, I guess, the, the Lemba. You know, these, these groups all tend to generally be wealthier, um, tend to be. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of those effects even persist in when they immigrate to, to Western countries. Uh, but, but yeah, these are all of no interest to people who just want to look yeah. at and, and the, the, versus non the, the last point I'm going to, to, to say in relation to the topic is the issue of farming. So in farming cultures, when there's an emphasis on entrepreneurship and privatization, people tend to earn more. But in collectivistic farming cultures, relative often own the land for several generations. They are less inclined to sell property. And those people on average have less money than their peers who are entrepreneurial. So disparities are explainable by many variables. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the book by Achir Moglu and Robinson, and I'm- Yeah, Darren Asimugla and Robinson, yes. which one? They, they, could, they looked at two, two groups in, in somewhere in Southern Africa across a river, and one was wealthy and the other wasn't, and it was all- Why nations with. fail? Yeah. Okay. And it was all again these these sorts of in the internal culture of groups. Some groups emphasize um, savings and education, and um, and they tend to be successful. Although although you can go too far with this. So you know the ultra orthodox Jews emphasize religious education um, up until your men not working. That's clearly they're quite poor. They're not going to do well. So you know it just depends on what. Different cultures can emphasize different things, and, and you have to look at that if you really want to explain. I think most of the variation in income is to do with differences in culture, uh, what is emphasized. I mean, it's interesting, you can, you can look at, I mean, if you look at Black Americans, apparently they were really rising quickly in the early, I mean, Thomas Sowell talks about Yes, that. from 1940 to 1960, the poverty rate declined by 40%. Yeah, and, and and in some ways, you know, they they were much more oppressed, but I th but but apparently they had to form their own associations. That you know, they had to organize everything themselves. Civil society. David Beto, he he also writes on the topic. Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, so I think clearly the sort of sixties more left modernism has had a lot of negative effects. Uh, on on African Americans, you know the decline of the black family, and and which which the families were all intact largely in the fifties, but uh, you know, uh, and now of course you see that decline of the family amongst whites too in uh, the white working class. So that's leading to many of these same effects. Um, yeah. So, but of course that's of little.
little interest to those trying to explain inequality. They don't really want to go look at the number. Yeah, but Eric? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't, you weren't right. able to hear me, but the, so okay. hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, good, good, good. I cannot afford for this meeting to end abruptly. So are you still here? Okay. Yeah, good, yeah. Yes, I am. I'm from a developing country, so crazy stuff like this happens all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's really unfortunate. But even when we talk about slavery, in, Bar in, in Bahamas, in Jamaica, and in the American South, slavery did not destroy the family. Some slave owners actually encouraged families because they could use the family to punish men and women. So if you misbehaved, you were told that we're going to take a, separate you from your family. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so it's slavery did, it had a negative effect on the family, obviously, because you could separate slaves. But for the most part, people formed relationships. And even when they didn't reside on the same plantation, they could go and visit each other. Okay. Yeah, I mean, interesting. You know, it's, very, it's, it's very hard to get a, I mean, obviously, the, the whole slave thing is so shot through with slavery thing is so shot through with ideology. It's very hard to get a sense of exactly what the average conditions were. Um, the, the, because, you know, again, I don't know enough about the subject. How, how many owners whipped? How many owners, you know, what was the life span like? What, how much family? Yeah, well, we do know, what we do know is that in the American South and the Caribbean, the material consumption of slaves was similar to working class people. So you can consult J.R. Ward and other academics. Okay. Yeah, that's what yeah, we because, do know. Because there's some, there is a literature, I think, that argues that, in, that a lot of the slave owners were, at least in the U.S. South, they, the poor whites who didn't have the slaves were seen in a sort of hostile way by the, by the slave owning whites. There was kind of competition there and they, their slaves were they didn't i mean if you own some property presumably you you want to tr you know treat it and i don't know i mean that they treated, the treated they well were, so th that they were benevolent or at least i don't know if they were benevolent yeah. but uh, but certainly they were uh, they, in terms of they were like economists then. yeah but i just whatever the truth is it would just be nice to get an objective read on the situation it's a bit like lynching too where you know it's talked about and it happened it was horrendous but the numbers across you know a period of 100 plus years it was sort of 3,000 in a population of you know 9 million or whatever it was um, so it's it's a rare occurrence I was wondering one of the things you wondered why there weren't more lynchings if it was something that everyone was doing and everyone approved of so what, what we don't know is who disapproved what roughly was the kind of opinion yes. uh, slavery was a peculiar society what's that S slavery was a peculiar society white slave owners were racist but they loved money more than how they hated blacks so it wasn't right. unusual for southerners to purchase goods from slaves or from Bayesian planters or jamaican planters to purchase goods from their slaves they liked money Right, right. Yes, I mean, yeah, and I, again, it, it's 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 so hard to know what the what the truth is. But but in any case, um, the slave obviously slavery is something that has again it's existed everywhere through through history, um, and so this again needs context. I mean, the uh, it's no one will talk about, for example, that you know what were the dis the ancestors of the. Um, African Americans, for example, would be from West Africa. Yeah, they owned slaves. They owned the empire and Asante. Yeah, and they also were like they conquered the pygmies and the yeah. Bushmen, and it's the same thing that occurred with the American Indians. That it was a people who had um, animals and and were herders. Uh, had uh, immunity to diseases, and so they could wipe out. And they also had weapons. And so they therefore wiped out a lot of the hunter gatherers. That, that's the theme of the uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, the, the book uh, Jared by, uh, what's his name? Jared, Jared Diamond. Diamond. Yeah. So, so, so this is not 
the theme of um, pastoralists wiping out hunter-gatherers uh, or agriculturalists wiping out hunter-gatherers, that, that is sort of a global thing. It's not, and, and African, Black Africans did it and the whites did it. And, and so, it, I, but these are all, nobody talks about these. People do. I have a piece on the topic for Mises. It's titled Slavery in the Asante Empire of West Africa. All right. And they have another piece for Mises about the Jamaican Maroons. The British conquered the Gold Coast, but prior to the to, to British rule, Asante Empire was the imperial power. And the other groups on the Gold Coast, they did not appreciate the tyranny of the Asante Empire. By conquering the Asante Empire, the, the British made it easier to, to trade. And, and these territories were removed from its orbit. So British colonialism, in a sense, replaced Asante colonialism on the Gold Coast. And in Nigeria, it replaced the Sokota Caliphate. Colonialism is a part of history. It's not new. Yeah, I mean, I do. I'll just note that, that Marx had a, an entire category of society called a stage called slave societies. That was sort of a world's historical stage that societies went through. Uh, anyway, so it's pretty universal. But, you know, it's that's not the way it's narrated today that's for sure you know eric i invited you so we could talk about your book the rise and fall mm. of anglo america and we have done this but culture is such an interesting topic so jared rubin was on the show recently we're going to talk about the middle east and the great divergence and for the first 10 or 20 minutes we discuss culture right yeah but we're going to move on to another paper you wrote the end of secularism it's the end of secularism, the end of secularization in Europe, a socio-demographic perspective. Just give a brief summary. You don't need to be too long. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's basically um, one of my arguments is that um, demography is the kind of anti-secularizing force uh, because uh, religious people tend to have larger families than non-religious people, pretty much around the world, and especially in developed countries. Um, and so you have this gap, which may only be a quarter of a child or a half child on average, number of children a woman will have in her lifetime, but that's enough to, over generations, make a big difference. And especially where you have these committed um, religious sects like the Amish or the ultra-Orthodox that have sort of three, four times as many ch children yeah. as everyone else and have very, make, and it's very hard to leave those religious sects, then they very quickly multiply. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, essentially in Europe and in the US that the secular population has very low birth rates, low fertility. They rely largely on switching from religious communities to replenish their uh, population. Going forward, the question is how quick the um, movement of people from religion to secularism will be. Uh, I think they've realized a lot of their gains uh, already uh, in the first phase of secularization, I think it's going to be harder to recruit the numbers that they need to keep yeah. the population yeah. becoming more secular and I, I, move past 2050. Yeah, I agree with you, Eric, but I have a different perspective. Secularism is a European wide event. So, for example, when fertility was originally reduced, the trend traveled throughout Europe. People tend to appropriate the culture of their peers who are genetically and culturally similar. So for example, British households outside of Britain also practice contraceptive co contraception. It's similar to technology. The, the French and the Germans appropriated British technology and some contend that income disparities can be explained by genetic similarity. We're more likely to follow people who are like us. So my argument is that secularism is a European issue. If Nigeria, for example, were to become a secular state, maybe Ghana and South Africa would follow, maybe countries in the Caribbean would, would follow. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think you're right if you look at where in the world has seen secularization. Uh, I mean, if we just put East Asia aside for a minute, but if we just look at the the rest of the world, um, it's pretty much, you know, Europe, North America, and now more increasingly in South America, particularly the more European southern tips of South America. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It definitely does. Whereas in India, uh, which has become wealthier, 
we haven't seen this secularization to the same extent. And in East Asia, there's actually been an increase in Christianity in, in China and Korea. Yes, and, and, and Christianity is exploding so, in some part of China, Latin America and Africa. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think um, you're right. What we haven't yet seen is large scale secularization in a non-Christian country. Now, I mean, East Asia, of course, had Taoism and it had Buddhism and it had various, it had a different kind of religious structure, more ancestor worship, and, it, and it's, it's harder to make, to see exactly, I mean, yes, they are in some ways non-religious, but on the other, on the other hand, they're not. So it's very a tricky case, but um, yeah, it just does, definitely seems to be a Western thing and it's tied, uh, tied to a number of different processes in the way, I mean, there's whole theories of secularization, Steve Bruce, for example, uh, puts it down to the fact that the toleration for many different beliefs leads to belief uh, belief in any one of those religions weakening uh, over time. And so there, and, and there's a kind of fragmentation of society which weakens uh, religion. And, and so that, but that seems to be more limited to the West. Yeah, and there's an interesting argument proposed by Rothorn, Robert Rothorn. He argues that even if the children of religious people become more scientific, they are also obedient and conservative. So secularism may not percolate throughout the West because we tend to inherit the personalities of our parents and religion is correlated with obedience. So a scientist who's not religious is still obedient. So his children may become religious. I mean, it's an interesting one. We haven't, I mean, one thing we haven't seen is a lot of religious revivalism or, or return of religion in Western countries. Yes, we've seen it in China, but outside of that, I mean, I mean, one of the things that's happening in say the US is that increasingly, and this will be interesting to watch, but increasingly because of political polarization, there's less interaction now across the party divide. People don't want their children to marry. If they're Republicans, they don't want their kids to marry a Democrat and vice versa. Assortative mating politically that's correlated with religion too, because if you go, if you look at, say, university students in the U.S., you know, one of the biggest predictors of being, say, a Republican is being a Christian, uh, and so they're kind of maybe we're seeing this thing where religion and party are overlapping now and the, and the, and re mutually reinforcing. So secularism and being a Democrat or Christianity and being a Republican, at least amongst white Americans, and so that. That could lead then to these groups to kind of becoming endogamous. And, and under that scenario, you would expect the Christian group to, uh, the Christian Republican sort of group to expand more. And, and a good example would be the state of Utah, which is heavily Mormon, has the highest uh, birth rate in, in the United States um, and votes the most Republican in the United States. There's, there's, there's a, quite a strong correlation between state level uh, birth rates and Republican voting amongst white Americans. So maybe that's where we're headed. I mean, it's it's certainly a possibility. Yeah, and if we become more religious, that's not necessarily a negative. Religious people are more likely to volunteer. They're, they're also happier and the church builds social capital. So I don't view the growth in religion as a disadvantage. Yeah, it's an interesting one, and I think that that there there it's probably a matter of pros and cons, um, you know. And and you know there are, you know, one of the projections that I make in the book is that there could be, you know, three hundred million Amish in the U.S. in the twenty two hundreds if they keep growing the way they've been growing for the last hundred years, for the next two hundred years. So yeah, um, it's all a question of of pros and cons, I guess. Yeah, interesting. But I want you to briefly summarize another paper you did. We promised to discuss it. The Diversity yeah. Wave, a meta-analysis of the native-born white response to ethnic diversity. Yeah, this is a paper I did with, with a colleague, Matt Matthew. Goodwin, where we, yeah, Matthew Goodwin, where we, um, we essentially were arguing, you know, what is the relationship between uh, the level of ethnic diversity in a political unit and support or opposition for uh, to immigration and support for populist right parties and candidates. Uh, 
So one argument might be that the, the more diverse uh, a city or a region is, uh, the more comfortable with diversity people are and the less likely they are to support populist right parties. What, what we actually see is that, in fact, uh, it depends on the scale. So it, in your neighborhood, if it's more diverse, you tend to be more tolerant of diversity. But if you go to the level of the city, the county, greater diversity tends to lead the white population or tends to be linked to the white population being uh, more skeptical of immigration and more likely to vote for the populist right. But, but in particular, it's where you have an increase, a sudden change in the ethnic composition in um, a short period of time that you almost always see a reaction in terms of uh, negativity towards immigration and greater support for populism. So that was kind of the, just the paper was looking at the different sizes of geographical units and whether diversity is correlated with um, immigration restrictionism and populist voting. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, but you know, Eric, Eric? Yeah. Yeah, before we go, I, yes. have, I have a point to make. So some accused you of defending white identity politics because of the book you wrote, White Shift. I am uninterested in identity politics, but if blacks can call themselves nationalists and the Chinese are always creating Chinese benevolent associations, why can't white organize on an equal scale? After all, tribalism is genetic. We're innately tribal and we're likely to prefer people in our boat. So I'm not a nationalist, but I don't have a problem with people express, expressing nationalist sentiments. And if you defend white identity politics, it doesn't make you a white nationalist or a racist. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the the it's the um, double standard really that that is important. And, but also the fact that uh, the fact that you know people, if you look at where people live, who they marry, there is a a certain degree of ethnic homogamy of, of people uh, moving towards and marrying each other. And by the way, that's the same for uh, white leftists as it is for white populist right supporters. I've done um, quite a bit of work on that, which shows that white leftists and white conservatives move to both move to relatively white areas. Uh, and there's very little, almost no difference between them. Um, so actually, white progressives have the same predilections in terms of who they're friends with, where they move to, in terms of how they discriminate, they're actually behaving in the same sort of way as white conservatives. What's different is, of course, is the ability to uh, have your identity recognized and express it, which I think, I don't think there's a problem with that. Now, I, the problem I have is, is, is what, I think Jonathan Haidt makes this point. You can have a, a uh, common enemy version of identity politics, which is, you know, I am, a Serb because I hate Croats, or I'm Irish because I hate the English. That kind of um, zero sum oppositional um, common enemy version of identity is is very negative, I think. Yeah, very uh, dangerous. On the other hand, you can, yeah, but if it's just pride in uh, history, pride in, in achievements, uh, pride uh, you like the culture, whatever, I think that is a uh, what Height would call a common humanity form of identity. People aren't going to stop having their identities. Um, but they can have them in a kind of liberal way, which is um, not about hating other people, not about zero sum, and also allowing for interracial marriage. And, and, and so the, what, what really matters is, in a way, the subjective common beliefs in common ancestry, in common traditions and memories. And so, so that isn't strictly tied to, uh, to race. I mean, so, so I think that's part of where I was going on, on this. And you know, looking ahead, there's probably going to be more mixing. But the, the point is that, you know, to have a double standard where certain identities are, are seen as toxic, like yes. white or male, and others are, are just seen as, as fantastic. Um, so, so one of the questions you can always ask is, oh, well, if, you know, African Americans achieve income, perfect income equality, do they lose the right to, to have their identity now? Is that what we're going to do? I mean, it's, it's yes, crazy. If you conflate it with poverty. But Eric, I was not surprised that minorities supported Trump. Polls have been informing us for years that Blacks are socially conservative and skeptical of immigration, even legal immigration. People from Vietnam and some parts of Europe dislike communism and Trump attacks socialism. So minorities were voting with their pockets. 
and Trump is a transactional character. If he delivers, then people will vote and he promised to, pr to preserve jobs for minorities and prior to COVID, the rate of unemployment for Blacks and Hispanic was low. So minority support for Trump is quite plausible. To, to be honest, many minorities want America to remain very rich. They oppose migrants moving to America and infiltrating the country with negative practices that are evident in the developing world. Yeah, and I, well, I think it's this is sort of the big takeaway from the 2020 election is the, the big shift of minorities towards the Republicans. And, and, the, and, and actually, if you look at the uh, underlying party identity data, the peak minority attachment to the Democrats was 2008. I think it's about 75% identified as Democrat. In the last, uh, the last numbers I've seen for 2019, um, that's now down to 50%. So from 75 to 50%, there's been a big drop. Now, a lot of the minorities are now floating independents, uh, but more of those are now biddable by, by the Republicans. Yeah, yeah. I think you're gonna see a continued shift uh, it's also, by the way, worth noting that minorities can have an attachment, uh, well, sort of a patriotic attachment uh, to a nation, and which involves being attached also to the ethnic composition of the country, yes. uh, the the way they knew it growing up. So I think there are, for all these reasons, we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, it's something similar in Europe, where uh, certainly in Britain, where there's a, a significant minority Brexit vote. Um, so yeah, that's one to watch. I, it'd be very interesting to see in the next election what happens to the minority vote. Yeah, but Eric, it was a pleasure speaking to you. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. So at some point again, okay. we, we can talk. All right. Fantastic, bye. Lipton. Well, yeah. thanks for the opportunity and all the best. All right, bye. Bye-bye.